Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and a warm, uh, very warm welcome to our webinar on the rise of criminal states and implications for global security. My name is Stefano Betti. I'm chairing this event. I'm here in my role as um, associate fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. For those who don't know the Institute, um, it is a, a world leading authority on global security, political risk, and conflict. And in particular, we are having this webinar in the framework of the Conflict Security and Development Program, which monitors armed conflicts and instability globally. And as part of this program, uh, as part of this, um, we also analyze transnational criminal dynamics and the repercussions um, for global security and stability. I'm joined by an outstanding panel uh, of speakers, which I will introduce in order of appearance. We have with us uh, Dr. Louise Shelley, who is the Omer and Nancy Hurst Endowed Chair and a university professor at George Mason University. She directs the Terrorism Transnational Crime and Corruption Center that she founded. Uh, Dr. Shelley is a leading expert on the relationship among terrorism, organized crime, and corruption with a particular focus on the former Soviet Union. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Pennsylvania. Paul Radu, and the second speaker, is an award-winning investigative reporter. He is co-executive director and chief of innovation at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. He has held a number of fellowships, including the Stanford Knight Journalism Fellowship. Paul is a board member of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. And then the third speaker will be Mark Nuttall, who is Director of Risk Solutions for Thomson Reuters in the Asia and Emerging Markets region. He has an extensive counterterrorism and, and risk background and over 20 years of experience in global risk management, anti-financial crime, and international security. He's a fellow of the Chartered Management Institute, the Institute of Paralegals and the Royal Society of Arts, and holds a master's degree in international security. So before, before we start, let me just stress that we would like this event to be as interactive as possible. And to this end, I'm inviting you to put your uh, questions or, or comments in the Q and A um, box that you will see in, in the platform. And we'll pick them up in the course of the panel and in the question and answer session uh, that will follow. Okay. Um, with that, allow me to get the ball rolling, actually, um, by saying that one intriguing, one intriguing aspect of the notion of criminal state is that everybody understands pretty much, pretty well what it is about, but usually finds it very difficult to define it. And the concept is undoubtedly a slippery one. Sometimes we use the expression narco states, for example, when we want to stress the role that certain countries play as transit points for the drug trade. Um, some people talk about mafia states or kleptocracies, which emphasizes the systematic theft of a country's wealth by its governing elites. We would suggest that the notion of criminal states also has some important points of um, convergence with the notion of failed states. And, and by failed states, we, we really mean, we refer to those political bodies which have become incapable of exercising their normal functions of a, foreign, of a, of a sovereign government. And a failed state may indeed become a criminal one when certain organized criminal groups are effectively ruling the country. But whatever you want to call it, it seems that what makes a state a criminal one is not simply the presence of a high criminality rate among public officials. There has to be something more than that. There has to be a situation where an individual or a group of individuals sitting at the top of one or more uh, public institutions effectively hijacks the state agenda 
by making it a tool for the achievement of their own personal um, criminal ends. As a result, parliaments become filled with cronies, judges systematically render uh, politically based decisions, the executive branch of government, including law enforcement, abuses its, its discretionary uh, powers to suit the criminal interests of their masters, the media becomes adept in the, in the art of self-censorship, and so on and so forth. The vicious um, system of government, of governance, actually, that arises, feeds itself through a mix of coercion, violence, threats, but also a whole array of incentives and enticements. We can mention just a few, the prospects of promotions, rewards, access to natural resources, trade privileges, and so on and so forth. Um, it's telling that the Global Organized Crime Index, um, which is produced by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, mentions that in 112 out of 193 countries, state embedded actors have a significant or severe influence on society and state structures. And another interesting finding is that of the 16 countries receiving a high score for state embedded criminality, all but three are identified as authoritarian under the Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index. Okay. Now, that was just a very, very short introduction that um, um, I, I decided to make just to warm up the engine a little bit and uh, we'll now turn to to our speakers. And without further ado, I think we can start with Dr. Shelley, which I just, uh, which I just introduced. And so Dr. Shelley, many thanks for having uh, come and accepted our invitation. Could you give us a sense of when and how historically organized crime began to infiltrate the state leading to the present situation and also, if you want, um, can you give us one or two examples of contemporary state criminality that you find interesting to mention as case studies? Certainly. So, so thank you. When you asked me to do this, it was a bit of a, a trip down memory lane, because now as you talk about, you know, 112 states that have been identified as having criminal infiltration into the state. When I started working on this issue in the early 1990s, this was not a problem that people thought much about outside of Italy. And I was working at that time in the former Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was just falling apart in 1991, and the emergent post-Soviet structures were emerging. And from the start, we had the beginnings of massive privatization of most of the state-owned resources of the Soviet state. And who was getting these? Who had the money to buy these resources? There were vouchers that were worth almost nothing that would get you almost none of this property. And from the very beginning, it was organized crime figures who were buying them or oligarchs who were, acquire, who were acquiring these properties with the assistance of criminals. And so from the start, there was a massive transfer of state resources to criminals and oligarchs that determined the course of the state. So many people in the early 1990s were saying we're going to see a rise of democracy and free markets. And I was saying, no, with this structure and movement of state assets, meaning factories, banks, media, into the hands of this criminal corrupt elite, this was not going to happen. But nobody wanted to hear that. And there was a lot to be learned from the Italian experience because Italy at the same time as, or a little bit before, 
in the 1980s was, had been engaged in, in massive privatization of state property. Before this privatization in Italy, about 40% of major enterprises were owned by the state. But Italy tried to do more vetting to try and make sure that organized crime did not buy up all of state assets. But none of this was done in the former Soviet states. And more than that, there became many laws that were introduced all over the states of the former Soviet Union, that if you entered a legislative body, that is a national legislative body, a regional legislative body, you were immune from criminal investigation and prosecution. So that expedited the movement of criminals into the state structure. And recently I was looking at somebody who was on a sanctions list who has a past in criminal activity. And he's been a member of the, of the Russian legislature since 1999. So well over two decades has this been continual infiltration of the state by a member of a, a, a member of one of the leading organized crime groups. He's now known as a, a businessman. Of course, he's a philanthropist, but this is how early and how permanent this infiltration was to, into the state. And one thing that's very interesting, and I was going back and reading something that I wrote in 1999 on this problem, was the divergence already at that time between Russia and Ukraine, and how there was such a nationalist sense in Ukraine that they wanted to build a healthy state, that there was awareness of this problem. So already, in 1998, you'd had the arrest of Lazarenko, and the, who was a former prime minister of Ukraine, who had bought the estate of one of the major sports figures in the United States. And with the help of the successor government in Ukraine, he was arrested, his property was confiscated. And so there was an effort already more than two decades ago in Ukraine, not sustained, but very different from what was going on in Russia to bring accountability to criminals helping to run the state. And that's something that we're seeing now in this tension between Russia and Ukraine, in that Ukraine has been trying for more than two decades to um, oust the criminals that are part of the state structure and to bring some accountability to the system. In the late 1990s, when I was writing about the situation in Russia and Ukraine, the other key examples of this problem that were in a volume that I contributed to were Mexico, Nigeria, and Hong Kong, all of which had organized crime um, occupying positions in government or bribing positions in government. And I, can, I think that we can look at these uh, jurisdictions and see that once this infiltration occurred, it has not been eliminated. We still have major problems in Mexico, in Nigeria, it is the epitome of the political criminal nexus, as is Mexico. And Hong Kong, um, despite being uh, under the thumb of mainland China and its anti-corruption campaigns, has not managed to um, clean up its criminal activity, which is operating in cyberspace, in distribution of counterfeits, and many, many other activities. So this is the past um, that shapes the present. It's not gone, it's just that we need to think about how transfers of assets in countries can embed these criminal relationships in the state and how 
criminals in legislature are not just there to protect themselves from prosecution, but are then helping to shape the legislation that gives them impunity and the ability to continue financially raiding, raping the state, as we've seen with the term that's become so popular lately of kleptocracy. One of the regions I've been most looking at lately is Central America. And as we talk about this massive migration that is coming to the United States from Central America and the you know, em emphasis or impact that it's having on American politics, I think we need to think a lot more about how this criminal political nexus and the infiltration of crime into the state is shaping this phenomenon. Because with criminals controlling state apparatus in many countries in Central America, and with the people in, within the state bureaucracy who've been fighting corruption, being themselves arrested or forced into exile, the situation gets only worse. So how is this happening in Central America? It's a very different phenomenon from what we see in, in post-Soviet states. But surprisingly enough, some of those same oligarchs that we've seen in studying uh, the post-Soviet space crop up in Central America buying mines and violating the rule of law and court judgments to obtain natural resources. And that's going on in Guatemala at this moment. And those who've been investigating the corruption that facilitates this have been forced to leave. So we have, for many years, there was this body called CSIC that ran under the United Nations that tried to bring corrupt and uh, officials, many of them corrupted by organized crime, some of them corrupted by foreign governments, to accountability. But that body has been ended, and, it's, and similar bodies elsewhere in Central America have been ended. And without any accountability, there is no check on this problem. So for a while, there were honest officials, there were legal apparatus to address this issue. And if you relent on this problem, then you have a reemergence of, of these criminal political um, relationships. And I think I'm looking at Stefano's face and I see this recognition of something that I've studied and observed in Italy, is that you go through waves in Italy where you crack down on this problem, you stop cracking down and the criminal political nexus reemerges with force. And so this is, something that we need to think about of when the roots have been laid, how difficult it is to rid the state of this relationship. And I think we need to think about this Russian-Ukrainian conflict in part being shaped by this relationship in which Russia has totally put up with the criminal oligarchical relationship and Parts of the Ukrainian state and civil society have been fighting with it for over two decades, leading to massive protests, um, exile of political leaders, and offending Moscow as they have done this. And so we have not seen that much in our discussions of this war that keeps going on. But this topic that we're looking at is absolutely at the core of this conflict. Thank you. Many, many thanks to you, Luis, for this very interesting uh, insight and uh, which you even managed to link with the current geopolitical situation in Ukraine, in Russia, and, uh, and actually was fascinated to, to learn from you um, that there was this connection between Russian oligarchs and what's actually happening in some Central American states. Extremely interesting, uh, food for thought. And um, and now, in the instance, in the interest of time, I would move to you, uh, Paul, 
um, as a second uh, as second speaker. And my so broad question to you would be, what do you see as the main drivers, factors that have enabled the surge and consolidation of criminal states? And also based on, on your research as an investigative journalist, do you have any examples that you find particularly eloquent and worth sharing with our audience? The floor is yours. Thank you, Stefano. Yes. Um, and uh, thank you, Louise. Uh, this was uh, an amazing uh, description of, uh, of the past, uh, the present and the future when it comes to criminal states and to their relationship with organized crime. And I must say, I learned uh, a lot from Louise over, uh, over the past two decades. I've, uh, I've read her books when I started my investigative reporting focused on organized crime and corruption. So thank you. Um, and I'll just follow uh, on something that, um, that Louise said. Um, that this is a continuous fight, right? With ups and down, uh, you can't really let your guard down because, you know, these um, criminal structures are in many instances ossificated. You know, they're part of the state systems um, uh, in Europe, uh, in North America, South America, everywhere. Um, and if I actually go back to Ukraine um, and I look at the, the current uh, Russian invasion uh, into Ukraine, uh, what I can see is that, you know, historically you'd have these conflicts um, along these religious fault lines. You know, you look centuries, you know, ago and you see all this, all this conflict, you know, between orthodoxy, Catholicism, you know, and, and, uh, and Islam and all that. And I think right now this, you can see this conflict, this war that uh, Russia ignited in Ukraine through the lens of a kleptocracy fault line, you know, and I think um, Louise mentioned it, you know, the fact that it was harder for, uh, you know, people affiliated with the Kremlin, with the oligarchs to conduct business as, as usual in Ukraine in the 90s, but it, it became extremely hard after 2014, because what happened in Ukraine was there was um, more transparency. Um, in fact, uh, if I'm to judge from the perspective of the investigative reporter, it was easier after 2014 to conduct uh, follow the money work in Ukraine with the partners in Ukraine than it was in many other Western states because the databases were open. You could track down a company, you could, uh, could track down state subsidies, you could tra track down a wealth of data that informs the investigative reporting. Now, all this transparency that was implemented in Ukraine um, damaged how kleptocracy, how kleptocrats could, uh, could have gone about their business as usual. So, and Zelensky in himself, and I, I, I must uh, say that, uh, you know, at first I, I didn't have much, much trust in Zelensky and how uh, he would be, you know, confronting Russia because he was affiliated initially with the uh, big time oligarchs in the country. And the, the, the fact that Zelensky managed to, to get off that influence, it's amazing. And, and, and it shows that, you know, when there's will, you know, there's, 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 there's actually things happening uh, in, a, in a very, very good way. Um, unfortunately, the good way that, that Ukraine uh, took in order to grow their state, in order to increase transparency, to stamp uh, corruption and organized crime, was a big thorn again in the in the side of the Kremlin. So I think this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons for the war that uh, Putin started uh, in Ukraine. Um, and si since I mentioned um, uh, religious uh, fault lines before, I, I, I should also also mention that a big part of um, of the state, especially in uh, the Oriental Europe, in, in in Eastern Europe, is is the church. And the church itself is part of the war that we're seeing now uh, on Ukrainian territory. I mean, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, unfortunately, has been corrupted for, for decades. I would recommend you read um, the Mitrokin Archives, uh, an amazing, amazing book about um, uh, that was uh, written uh, in cooperation with Vasily Mitrokin, who was uh, a KGB ar uh, archivist in the, in the 70s, 80s. And he's described how the Orthodox Church in Russia was used to acquire criminal ends. Um, they were used for money laundering. They were used for, for many, for influence operations and uh, all sorts of others. So 
religion still plays a very, very important role in this, in this conflict, um, except it, it has been attached to criminal, uh, criminal interests. Now, when I'm seeing this um, kleptocracy fault lines, what I'm seeing um, for the past uh, 10 years, let's say 15 years, since we've started investigating these large scale organized crime operations and these large scale money laundering operations, uh, we're seeing Russia, we're seeing Iran, uh, we're seeing um, uh, China quite a bit. And we're seeing that these are the countries that are, are currently working together to some degree uh, unfortunately, we're, we're also seeing countries like uh, um, uh, Ar uh, Arab countries involved in not explicitly endorsing the war, but condoning some of the of the behavior there and helping Russia economically. So I think this is um, this is a point where um, we do have on one side, you know, the, the, the kleptocrats on the other side, the democracies, but Unfortunately, for many decades, the democracies were penetrated by kleptocracy in the sense of providing criminal services to uh, these, these thieves uh, in these countries. So there's a huge disconnect that I think is going to play a very in interesting role um, uh, in how public life will be shaped in the next years, in the sense that because oligarchs in the former uh, Soviet Union, uh, and especially in Russia, don't really have access anymore to the goods and the real estate and the uh, uh, investments in the West. And you know, that, that might, might actually trigger some, some changes in how law firms uh, function in the West, in how accountants function in the West, in how bank, the banking system functions in the West. So this is not just about you know, the, the effect of the oil uh, uh, you know, and the, the fact that Russia can cut you know, the, the access to gas and to other resources, but it's actually, you know, it, it's a big change in the sense of the divide between the, the services industry of the West and uh, what's going on right now in Russia. Um, I'll also say that um, a lot of these and a lot of the might that Russia and, and Iran still have was shaped by an efficient way of uh, implementing sanctions. We keep on hearing about sanctions, 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 and that's great. I mean, sanctions are good, but if implemented right. And the fact that, for instance, Iran can cooperate with Russia right now shows that there are huge gaps in the, in the sanctions uh, regimes. Because if you don't enforce sanctions at the global level in a meaningful way, and if if law enforcement doesn't understand how organized crime helps these countries bypass sanctions, you know, then you know, sanctions will not be as efficient as we want them to be. Um, and in fact, we're seeing a very interesting um, uh, cooperation uh, between Iran, uh, for example, and organized crime starting in about 2014, when the Ayatollah of, uh, of Iran asked for financial jihad. He declared financial jihad in the world, but what that meant was that Iran needed to bypass the sanctions and they asked the criminal worlds out there to help them do that. Now, at organized, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, the organization that I co-founded, we've investigated many instances of this, um, uh, of this financial jihad in the form of the, the laundromats. These are large scale money laundering operations where criminals of the world came to the rescue of Iran, helping them with all these nested uh, networks of companies and bank accounts uh, all over the world, including in the West, and they helped them bypass the sanctions. And as time went from 2014 until now, they perfected this sanction busting to a degree that's now that we see right now that uh, you know uh, in, in in Russia as well because Iran was always held by Russia uh, they were held by the neighbors in the west and I Iran was always held by China so when you look at this constellation of uh, of states that lean criminal um, and that are prone and are igniting uh, huge conflicts with with huge violence with huge life uh, life loss we see them as as being this club where they have a common interest in, first of all, bypassing sanctions and ensuring that their kleptocrats you know, are able to function and to loot um, as they've done for many decades. And I'll stop here. Thank you. And, and Paul, I thank you also very, very much for this very interesting um, presentation you made. 
your analysis of the phenomenon, the, the role of democracies in, uh, in, in actually sustaining directly or indirectly kleptocratic regimes, the role of religious institutions. And uh, the, we also have a question uh, that has been put by um, someone in the audience about, um, about the role of the Orthodox Church. We'll see it later on. And also the link you established with um, some current uh, international sanctions regime. So thank you very much again for this. And um, um, now I would like to, um, to invite uh, Mark, Mark Natal to, to make his 10 minutes presentation. Mark, can you give us your perspective on the criminal state issue in general, as the two previous speakers have, have done, including where you see it intersecting the corporate world and the international financial system? The floor is yours. Most, de most definitely, Stefano, and it's been uh, very interesting to hear from Louise and Paul. It's, um, it's great to be on board with them. Um, I, I don't see this as anything new, really. Anybody that looks at history, especially Roman history, ancient Roman history uh, from around 181 BC, will find one of the first bribery and corruption um, pieces of legislation that was in place. Uh, the word ambition comes from it, amb ambitus. Um, and, and from there, organised crime, uh, murders, uh, the movement of uh, finance and assets, uh, all poured through to um, all poured through to political corruption, political bribery, and and trying to gain the ballot um, to to lead the empire as it was back then. Um, time doesn't really change our um, affectability in relation to greed, in relation to wanting to um, move on, especially when you're in the uh, the criminal criminal um, endeavours that, that most individuals within these networks uh, are part of. Yes, they do call themselves businessmen. I've met many of them in my time and I've arrested many of them as well and convicted them. Um, Organised crime is something that I, I don't think uh, we will ever have a chance of, of stopping, but at least we can try and delay or, or, or pull back some of the effects of it. Um, what I'd like to talk about first is, is I'd like to move east a little bit. We've talked um, centrally, northern and also west. Um, and I'd like to talk about Malaysia and the 1MDB matter. The 1MDB matter, um, so one Malaysia development, Bahad, um, that was set up as a sovereign wealth fund for Malaysia. Um, it was a, a form of piggy bank um, for, uh, for Prime Minister Najib at the time and for a group of organised criminals, um, one of which was known J-Lo, who's currently, um, currently absconded and available for arrest. Um, however, Mr Najib didn't, um, didn't decide to do that. He decided to fight the court case. Um, but essentially, what, what occurred within that case was that a very brave journalist named uh, Claire Rucastle did a expose on some of the corruption that was occurring in one of the states, Sarawak. So Malaysia is separated into autonomous states, one of them being Sarawak. Sarawak was, um, or currently is led um, by a certain regime, I'm not going to go into the political nature of that, uh, but essentially throughout her um, throughout her investigation, what she uncovered was the environmental rape of the country, murder of its citizens, um, dilution of of the, uh, the 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 financial systems within Sarawak and within the autonomous regions of Malaysia that was flowing through, as well as substantial loans and. and diverse fraud mechanisms into one Malaysia development they had. Now, that was um, completely drained via um, the former prime minister, his um, group of uh, politicians that surrounded him, both militarily and politically. 
Um, there was around two to three billion that's USD that's been uh, accounted for so far, but it's um, it's meant to be much, much more that went through various financial systems that was never checked upon. Uh, and when it was checked, obviously, it's come from a sovereign wealth fund. So it's deemed to be legitimate <laughs> in some way, shape or form. So there was money flowing out to shell companies in um, areas such as the Seychelles. No, I'm English. Um, BVIs um, over to the Middle East and around the world through wonderful institutions such as Coots or RBS, JP Morgan, um, HSBC, and a number of others such as Credit Suisse, all in the multi millions, um, adding up to billions in the end. Um, they were distributed throughout the world. So that's uh, an entire country's. Substantial wealth um, that's been poured through an organised crime network, um, and that organised crime network as well. We're also dealing with mercenaries, dealing with drugs gangs, dealing with um, human trafficking uh, gangs as well, and, and the usual uh, the usual range of individuals that you find within the organised crime world. The organised crime world depends on facilitation agents or financial enablers that the FATF and other bodies have commented upon of late who facilitate these processes, including judges, doctors, uh, politicians, police officers of every single range and ilk, the military, uh, banking systems, uh, without these in place, and which is why the FATF are aiming at them, um, organised crime and have a very difficult time in working um, so they're trying to work across what are the FATF-friendly countries at the moment with a aim and target of working within the countries that aren't really bothered about having uh, FATF relations. Obviously, at the moment, uh, well, certainly within the last week, um, uh, Burma um, or Myanmar has been placed upon the black list via FATF. Um, that's created some, some stirring because obviously out of um, Burma at the moment, you've got refugees who are pouring over uh, the border into Laos, which is then, um, Laos, Laos, is a, Laos is a state that is under uh, a watchful gaze um, because it is at the moment housing a great deal of fraud and scam centres those fraud and scam centres that are operating are mostly staffed with either traffic humans from Myanmar, stroke Burma, depending on the geopolitical context, um, or from Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, um, and the rest of the ASEAN countries trafficked in and then um, forced to act as, as forced labour in, a, in a, a human traffic slave capacity. Um, within mostly casino environments, housed within casino environments and running scam centres throughout there. The money's then liquidated, poured through the casinos, poured through assets, poured through um, things like gold and silver bullion, uh, and then pushed through the normal financial system. Um, and I think that's my 10 minutes up. I hope that's been interesting. Um, it's incredible. All three speakers are incredibly disciplined. I've never seen any, anything like that. But it's good because we'll have time for uh, uh, for questions and for comments. Uh, many, many thanks to you, Mark, um, as well for this, um, what I found a very, very practical overview full of um, examples. You really show the dynamics at play here, the evolution of corporate policies and corporate recidivism, uh, country economic obfuscation and so on and so forth. Very very insightful um so we we have a little we already have a few questions and comments but uh, i am going to abuse my my role as a moderator if you don't mind and uh, i thought of adding just adding one uh, one element one element into into the debate uh, to make it richer and to to complicate things a little bit uh, a little bit more than than they already are and, and what I wanted to, 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 to suggest and to talk about for just five minutes is, um, um, is the fact that is the impact that the consolidation of criminal states 
worldwide may have on the current international legal order. I would like to hear also your, your views if we have time and, and, and that of the audience, of course. This international legal order relies on a network of regional and multilateral treaties in criminal matters. There, there are many, just to mention a couple of them, since we're talking about organized crime, the UN Convention Against Organized Crime, the UN Convention Against Corruption. So these and other treaties are based on the premise that the governments of their state's parties are fundamentally healthy. As a result, it is assumed that they are determined to crack down on organized criminal networks um, that are active on their territories, okay? And that are also determined to extend the highest level of cooperation to other states' parties that request it. Of course, these treaties recognize that criminal conduct of various forms is also carried out by public officials. Huh? Um, however, and, and, and this is, in my opinion, a critical point, the international legal order is based on the underlying idea that overall, organized crime remains a circumscribed phenomenon that most governments can control, perhaps not immediately, perhaps after having received technical assistance from the international community, capacity building, whatever you want, but that, that they can eventually control based on their goodwill, right? And here comes the, the contradiction, maybe the apparent contradiction, I don't know. How can you expect um, that the very people you should address the problem by, by applying the provision of these treaties do so when they are themselves the problem, right? And what I'm basically suggesting is that an international legal order, order that has so far relied on treaty-based engagements, international cooperation among public authorities, this order risks becoming increasingly ineffective in a world where criminal states might soon become the norm and no longer, and no longer represent the exception. Are we then going to see a world in which the classical channels for international uh, collaboration in criminal matters, um, typically extradition, mutual legal assistance, will lose their teeth in favor of a system of targeted governmental sanctions, for example, against foreign individuals deemed to be members of criminal syndicates. So that would mean more asset freezings, travel bans, exclusion from certain markets or business opportunities in place of traditional court order imprisonments. And I find it revealing that in 2020, the UK National Crime Agency has called for legislation to reference serious and organized crime as grounds for sanction use. If sanctions are, um, are set to become a major tool against organized crime, this will be a significant change of paradigm. For starters, the fight against organized crime will become a full-fledged um, a full-fledged political act. The sanctions are directly imposed and implemented by the executive power. Extradition and ML and mutual legal assistance procedures are also influenced by political considerations, of course, but at least they maintain an inbuilt element of judicial control. I don't know if I make it clear. Um, I, I'll stop here. I just wanted to offer this additional perspective, perhaps in a in a in a in a provocative and in an exaggerated manner to our speakers and the audience. And, um, and we'll see if we'll have time to, to discuss this. In any case, uh, now we can open the, the, the final and, and also very interesting uh, part of our, of our um, webinar, because I see that many questions and comments have flowed in. So I'm trying to um, look at them and already apologize with the members of the public that will not get an answer because we really, we are getting really so much mm. and uh, we have some, some, some time to go, but I may not be able to make everybody happy. Uh, but, and also I, I kindly ask the, the, the speakers to give um, a very short and concise answers so we can accommodate as many questions as possible. Um, 
uh, let me start with my very arbitrary selection <laughs> of the various questions. There is one that is specifically addressed to, to, to Louise. So it says, Dr. Shelley, what you are describing, the nexus of political and criminal, perfectly fits Cambodia. I would be curious to hear recommendations from the panel on how USG stakeholders, such as state, aid, or treasury, should collaborate to try to put pressure on these governments and protect the civil society that are trying to fight against the force of such a nexus? Well, I think there are many different ways and we've heard some of them. For example, uh, OCCRP has received, I believe some government support and you need active journalists, you need training of journalists, and you need the ability to publish stories if they can't publish outside their countries. There's also needs to be help for individuals who are um, on the front lines because of fighting this corruption, because sometimes their lives are threatened and they need to be provided some kind of safe haven and something that, that they can survive on if they have to leave. They're also, not in the hands of just government, but there are two um, pieces of legislation that I think should be considered. One is the Enablers Act, which is now before Congress to try and um, punish individuals who are enablers. And I could be very rich today if I would take on all the cases in which I am approached to testify for exiled corrupt politicians who are being defended by the most prestigious lawyers you can find in the world. So this is something where we need to focus on, just as this case of in Malaysia that was mentioned was facilitated, the, the, the environmental destruction of Sarawak was aided by Goldman Sachs and other very important financial institutions. So it's not just a problem of over there, it's a problem of taking two to tango. And there's a very interesting film on this called Borneo, mm -hmm. done by the Manzer Foundation because there was a Swiss activist murdered for investigating this in, in the early 2000s. And also we have, I hope, convene a group called the Anti-Corruption Advocacy Network. Put in the chat box if you'd like it to be added to the list. And on yesterday, we had a discussion on the anti-corruption court and whether one should be introduced internationally because as more international aid is going out in regards to climate change and others, there need to be some inter international instruments to help deal with this corruption that can't be dealt with internally in the country. So that's something not just for the US government, but for many others to help advocate for. Excellent. Um, there's a question specifically directed to Paul Radu. Um, what would Paul like Western nations do in terms of sanctions to close the gap that could prevent Russia from benefited, benefiting from dealing with Iran? Go into geopolitics very much. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a very hard question and I don't have... A... That's why I'm asking you. A, a, a formed a formed answer to it you know I'm, i mean uh, it, it's something that we're debating for so long and it's in my opinion you know the minimum uh we can do as let's say the international community is to continue with pinpointing sanctions you know this type of magnitsky type, uh, sanctions you know where you target officials rather than large uh, uh, parts of the population but what really is needed is to understand how Western enablers, and I think this, this enablers act in the US Congress is, is gonna be a big, big change. So how enablers in the West are aiding and abetting these type of uh, uh, activities. So once we understand that, and once we understand that that has been going on for a very long time, this has been uh, going on for decades. It's only, it's, it's not that, that now these uh, countries are becoming criminal. They have been criminal for, for a long, long time. It's only that we're seeing more, and that's good. So that's the the um, I'm I'm an optimist actually in the sense that once you identify the problem, you can deal with the problem. 
So this is, uh, I think we're at the stage where we're trying to understand as best as possible how these sanctions are uh, you know, avoided uh, by these countries, how Iran is able to cooperate with Russia military right now, it seems via Syria, for instance. So all these, um, all these avenues for, for organized crime and corruption are what Russia and Iran are using to their full extent um, because, and I actually remember uh, one um, uh, one conversation that I had in Rome. I think, uh, Louise, you were in that meeting too, organized by the NATO Foundation, where I presented a bit the role of Iran in all these uh, money laundering, large scale um, uh, 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 operations. And uh, at the end of that discussion, I was um, approached by a charge d'affaire by an attache of the Iranian uh, Iranian uh, embassy uh, or consulate in Rome. You know, so he was there in the in, in this meeting, and he said, "Look, uh, you're 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 actually wrong about your assumptions about Iran uh, being you know such an evil state because you know what the people that we we asked to help us they robbed us as well. So criminals have no allegiance. Criminals have no respect of of countries. You know, so I think this is if we if we manage to understand the criminal minds and how criminals are working with these countries and." how they're actually working sometimes, not in the interest of, the, of, of these countries, but in their own interest, I think that might make a bit of a dent in that harmony that exists right now at, at that level. So we really need to understand uh, a lot more. And uh, I, I have lots of uh, you know, thoughts about this, but you know, uh, you know, I, 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 I won't share them now. So um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm moving to what I find a very interesting um, question, which is also a, a proposition, an idea from from one of the from some of from the from the audience. And uh, the question is addressed to all panelists, so whoever wants to answer is welcome. How can large investment funds, or better, what can large investment funds do to deal with such criminal states? not invest or divest from everything or is there a middle way here so the role of divesting of, of investment funds in in disincentivizing the consolidation of criminal states depends on the investment firm it depends on the state and it also depends on what due diligence that organization has done in the first place most investors and most um, financial organizations don't tend to spend a great deal of time on due diligence. They'll do maybe the first um, link, the first network link, but they won't go second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Uh, I work in a corporate enterprise now. I've worked in government. I work like you, Stefano, and in Interpol. We all know that... Um, there's only a certain amount that they'll pay to do that due diligence. And, and actually it's in their, it's in the back of them, their minds that the tick box approach for them is the best possible route, because if they do then find out that there's something wrong, they can't invest in that very lucrative exercise. The, the way that um, a lot of, geopolitical and international organizations are trying to push it at the moment is within this framework of environmental social and corporate governance and trying to have investors think better and punishments within the country their host country if they are not investing in these um these esg forms of um stake for them um that soft power exercise appears to be working in some cases at the moment for some corporations but not across the board so some of the bigger organizations some of the bigger companies and their investors are starting to throw um, kind of greenwashing at the door which in terms assists with um, their due diligence exercises so i certainly know as a corporate that we get more and more and more as uh, with the more pushing that um, the geopolitical organizations do, but it's a slow boil process. 
it's certainly not going to go at any pace and not at the pace that um, certainly some of the members of this audience or some of the members on this panel today want it to go at. Um, in terms of investment, money makes the world go round. And as I stated earlier, this type of thing's been going on since the dawn of man, or at least since empires started to be built. So it, it's not going to go at any fast pace at the moment. But the more we try, um, is all is all is all we can really do. Thank you, um, Louise. Did you have a? I was just saying when you were talking about ESG over the past year and a half, I've been writing on analysis that we've been doing of human trafficking cases and where the victims are exploited. And it's very interesting that the key hub for exploitation are hotels. And some of those hotel chains are owned by investment funds that espouse their total commitment to ESG. At the same time, they are subject to large numbers of suits from victims and have been cited in federal cases for their involvement in facilitating this activity. So I have very little, um, how do I say, appreciation for what ESG is doing in a lot of the part of the corporate world. And what I totally agree with you about going down a few levels that corporate actors are not going to the depths. But even when you find this for the lawyers who are doing this work, Sometimes they just don't want to accept the fact that you found the smoking gun. Here's the smoking gun. And they don't even want to see that it smokes. Thank you. Paul, do you have I'll, anything I'll, to add? I'll agree, I'll agree, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. I'll just add that I believe that the private sector is uh, is very important in, in tackling this problem. And obviously, you, you have so many corporations uh, operating um, at this above state level. And I think that's where a lot of the action uh, takes place um, when it comes to criminalized states, you know, to, to this. So I think, um, and we're seeing right now this, uh, this uh, you know, that uh, lots of corporations, Western corporations are, are leaving Russia in various types of terms, it's actually a very inter interesting dynamic there. They they still leave you know doors open, which which might be good from the business side uh, side of things, um, and all. But but I think this, I mean, and especially in the financial sectors, uh, the banking system needs to really up their game when it comes to uh, large scale money transfers, and especially right now with um, the threat of uh, this. Um, uh, fractioning that um, that some countries want to go for in order not, not to fall under SWIFT, not to you know be uh, uh, in 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 order to actually create their own uh, financial systems. I think that's where we need to be to to understand a lot more what's going on because those systems won't be able to function without corresponding with the current systems anyway. So we do have to obviously look um, a lot more when it comes to corporations and their investments into crypto and how criminal states are using uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, we've seen this used to some scale in, in Russia, but also Iran and other countries. So I think there, there's a lot um, uh, to happen on the, on the side of the private sector because law enforcement, journalists, NGO, um, you know, won't be able to uh, without the private sector to really make make a difference um, as we go. And the other thing is, um, what I'm seeing is a lot of criminal enterprise. I mean, we're we're talking about you know corporations and all, but there are lots of criminal corporations out there that have amassed huge wealth over decades. Uh, it's what I call um, the criminal angel investors. These are criminals and uh, criminal organizations who have the money to fund to fund. Uh, criminal startups and this happens all over it happens in central america it happens in mexico it happens in in europe we're seeing these groups financing more crime because crime is very lucrative and it, it gives them you know a, a huge return on investment and they're just looking for the next generation of criminals and unless we understand this dynamic you know we'll be kind of sitting ducks for for these type of operations that are large scale and across nation states so not you know, clearly inside of any law enforcement agency. Thank you, Paul. And and there are a lot of questions about uh, Russia and the current uh, geopolitical situations. We can't cover all the questions, but there is uh, maybe maybe one that is is broad enough. 
and uh, and it goes um, with Russia's cut off from the West, can we expect an increase in state criminality along the lines of Iran and uh, North Korea, or will Russia pursue more unique avenues? Addressed to everybody, whoever has something. Please be short so <laughs> we can cover more questions. All right. What are the th things that we should be looking at and thinking about the Russian response is what is going on in cybercrime and this and and last about two weeks ago I heard a presentation from someone who runs a cybersecurity center saying that shortly after February they began to see a significant rise in Russian related cybercrime. So some of these actors are doing this themselves because they're fleeing the country and they need money and some of them are linked to the state but the phenomenon is already operating and there are people researchers already looking at it thank you mark paul anything to add um i i'd just say that on top of that and also paul's comments from before um obviously the shanghai cooperation organization held their meeting um a few weeks ago and uh, the road to de-dollarization is most definitely on its way, uh, along with central bank digital currencies popping up all across ASEAN um, to pull out of what is the um, kind of modern financial now going to be old system. Um, and that's going to be interesting for many, many reasons, most of which are what Louise and Paul have mentioned a moment ago. Um, one more question. Sometimes with these micro views of the problem, we forget this requires enablers throughout nearly all communities. So are there suggestions or recommendations for addressing some of these issues through more micro or more localized law enforcement efforts or focus? Um, if I may address Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, it, it's what we're seeing at OCCRP um, and we're, we're not having, uh, you know, I mean, we do have a global perspective, but a partial global perspective. Uh, we are a global organization. We gather information from all over the, over the world uh, through our editors, through our reporters. Um, and what you see is that when a criminal model functions in a, in a geography, in a country, it will for sure get replicated across borders. Is the same with the digital uh, realm. You know, when you see a, a ransomware package that works and that's sold on a on a on an illicit uh, dark market, you know, you'll see that uh, ransomware package used across the board. So I think one one of the issues um, with this uh, micro kind of kind of focus is that we don't quite use that micro focus to to inform the larger focus. You know, we need. There, there's there's no i mean there is some exchange of you know criminal patterns you know um between law enforcement agencies but obviously cooperation is fraught with with lots of problems um and especially when when there are issues that really affect uh, people or countries that are adversaries you know it, it, at least in on that level you know there should be some some exchange look this criminal group this you know the the the, the zetas in mexico or the jalisco cartel has opened up these new avenues to launder money all over the world, you know, and this is what we've identified somewhere in Jalisco in Mexico. And so those patterns should, you know, should be should be exchanged, um, not just between law, law enforcement agencies, because lots of these uh, patterns are not observed by law enforcement, but by locals, by communities, by activists, by journalists, by others. So I think there's need for more dialogue uh, uh, on, on uh, along those lines. Um, so I think the other thing is we, we need to approach this this uh, issue of um, you know criminal investments in a larger sense i mean a lot of the criminal money is invested in real estate all over the world and we've looked quite intensively uh, to london you know to the south of france to florida to to uh, other parts of the world that are the usual suspects let's say but there is and we've we've seen some of it um, and there might be a lot more there is an uh, a, a lot of buying of you know water surfaces forests, uh, agricultural land, and we haven't quite looked there. And this is a lot of money. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of billions, if not more. 
where do this money go? You know, this is usually they go, you know, invested in some sort of land or property or, or you know, there's the occasional yacht that's very expensive. And so I think, you know, identifying local trends and, uh, you know, expanding them to the global level and having this type of discussions right now, you know, in, 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 yeah. in even larger groups, it's what may make a bit of a difference. Excellent. Um... Um, I'm, I'm running to another question. Given the problems mentioned regarding the current state of international sanctions, can someone please elaborate about any global initiatives to improve sanction activities and improve their effectiveness? And also, if there are any efforts underway to create stronger controls to impede cooperation between sanction states such as Russia and Iran mentioned here. So something to improve the effectiveness of international sanctions, basically. Does anybody want to have a crack at it? Um, I know, it, just, just briefly, I know that at the level of the US government, there's um, there are efforts to um, create some, to harmonize uh, different departments that are involved in uh, uh, imposing sanctions and to kind of create um, right. a more kind of logic, clear strategy between between these departments, you know, the DOJ and, and, and others. So I think that's, um, there's some work along those lines, but obviously in this call, we have people who are much, uh, much more knowledgeable about, uh, you know, laws and what's, what's in place. And when you, um, when I, I'd, I'd say when you've warned, you know, as a former police officer, when you've warned somebody, what's the next move? The next move is to enforce something, to use physicality. Um, so obviously the next move after sanctions is blockades. But the problem is, is once blockades don't work, then we're entering into physical violence and we're entering into uh, territories that the West really doesn't want to enter into at the moment, as can be seen with the Russia-Ukraine situation. Um, so I, I think it's difficult, especially as I mentioned earlier with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization kind of splitting the world in two a little bit, um, because that can then mean that deals can be done and trade can be issued and items can be transferred in such a way that evolves that that doesn't involve um, the other side. I, I just go ahead. I just wanted to add one thing that to understand how these sanctions are work are are being evaded, we need to do a lot more network analysis. And I don't think our law enforcement, our government agencies are doing enough of this globally to see how, how the many pieces fit together. And in order to sanction people and cut off their, their lifeblood, you've got to know who they are linked to. Thank you. Um, and apology, we are moving from one subject to the other one, but I'm really trying to, to, you know, to cover all the, the interesting questions. One that is, is different from the issue of sanctions, one question is, do you have an assessment of how much official development assistance is siphoned off to corrupt governmental channels? Is there a country by country assessment chart on this subject similar to the Corruption Perception Index by Transparency International? As far as I know, I've never come across any such assessment, but maybe you have. I haven't seen any. Thank you. Okay. So, sounds like a good project if somebody wants to fund everybody. Does that sound good? <laughs> I, think, I think the closest this come has been sort of ex post facto examination of what went on in Afghanistan under SIGAR. But this is not, but there's no comparative point of reference in other societies. You'd, you'd essentially have to get that corrupt nation to. Um, right. Uh, disseminate where those monies have been distributed to, or at least find the end chain and work backwards. So it's it's quite an exercise. Moving to the next one, and we're almost done with this gigantic effort. Is there any way to to disrupt the political criminal nexus in a country without negatively affecting citizens not involved in this nexus? I think this is 
um, a difficult question and a complex one, and we haven't thought enough about what's going on at the individual level. Earlier this week, I heard a talk about removing municipal governments in communities, small communities in Italy and what this does. And there's some research that seems to indicate that it improves employment, especially of youth. But then there are all kinds of larger levels at which organized crime is operating. And since they are funding not just criminal ventures, but we've seen examples of oligarchical slash criminal capital funding some of the largest technology investments in the US, this has an impact on economic development as well. And so I don't think this is such a large part of the global economy that as you begin to tamper with it, there are consequences for everyone that are not foreseen, but there's not been enough intervention on all these different levels of business investment. But I, just... I remember as Italy provides some of the best examples, like when there was the white clean hands operation, then then the high-end hotels were empty because nobody had any money or wanted to show that they had any money. So these dislocations can be seen, but they're not very well understood. So I'll, I'll just you know second what uh, what Luis said and um, and that that communities where where you have this level of uh, uh, criminal state and criminal governance, um, they are already impacted by it. You know, the, the, the citizens are, are subject to theft and the violence and, and everything. I mean, we're seeing this in, in many countries. Um, but you can't be a purist about this, uh, and especially an uninformed uh, purist in tackling uh, um, organized crime and corruption, corruption. And I'm seeing this, for instance, in Latin America, where um, cities, large cities in Latin America, the, the mayors won on an anti-corruption platform where they didn't quite know what to do about anti-corruption. It was very populist, but without the understanding of what that entitles, what are the what are the supply chains, you know, behind what they want to tackle, um, what are what is going to be the impact on the on the local citizens in the short term, in the medium term, long term. So without this type of understanding, you know, and with going, uh, you know, off with slogans, that's that's not going to help for sure. This is why I mean, local authorities need to to understand you know the local level as well as the broader uh, you know uh, intertwines that that take place um, uh, that i think louise was was mentioning so without understanding the whole game and even then you know you have you can have various type of events you know that can um, can affect um, your approaches there's black swans and there there are other things that that will will be at play anyway so i think it really comes down to studying studying it a lot more but studying it between a lot more people. I mean, I'm looking at my industry, investigative reporting, and we're just a few thousand investigative reporters in the world. That's not merely enough to cover what's going on in terms of crime and corruption. And we need, you know, much, much larger numbers, and we need to change paradigms in, in how we cooperate across borders and in local communities in order to disrupt without actually destroying lives. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, um, there, there was a paper published, I think, by Michael Goddard in 1995 in relation to Papua New Guinea um, and how Port Moresby um, first developed through organised crime, um, through organised criminal gangs, etc. Um, and obviously it's a, it's a relatively developed town stroke city now. Um, but would Port Moresby have been that without the organized criminal networks or would it still be a small fishing village and would it have the infrastructure that it's got now without it? Uh, there's a lot of questions in relation to that in relation to most big cities. Um, you know, most big cities, have they attuned from organized crime and financial gain? Lots of questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. And Paul was mentioned in Latin America uh, before and I would like to um, emphasize one last question because then we'll have to, um, to wrap up and that concerns Latin America. For the Western, it's not necessarily uh, addressed to, to Paul, but um, to all speakers. For what, the Western Hemisphere in particular, is there any way to use the organization of American states 
to establish coercive standards against corruption and crime that may help stabilize Latin America? Very broad question, maybe just some key ideas you may, you may have on this. Well, I think in the, in the attendee list, we have somebody who's extremely qualified to answer this question, um, who's worked in this capacity at the OAS. But I think it's very important that multilateral organizations play a part in helping to support the, the weaker structures such as CSIG that needed support when it functioned and the OAS could help be leading support for groups that are trying to support the rule of law. Excellent. And, um, and now just before wrapping up, I just wanted to ask our speakers very, very briefly, having listened to each other and having heard the comments from the audience, um, if they have any additional comments or perspectives that they want to make and, and share with the audience. Maybe there is nothing, maybe, but just in case there is something that is you have on your stomach that you need to get out before the end of this webinar. One point I would say is that each of our speakers have talked about global networks. Right. So though you asked us to focus on a particular region of the world or one in which we're living in or have experience in, you start anywhere and you reach everywhere. And just as we're talking about, Mark was talking about these human trafficking and these into the scam centers in Southeast Asia, those scam centers are operating internationally. So th this is not as if we're, we're talking about regional problems anymore. We're talking about regional problems with transnational consequences. Uh, my final comment is watch the metaverse because we're about to enter into something that's far larger than anything that's in the physical one at the moment. Yeah, that's that. That will be a a, a big, big issue. I was uh, in a conference uh, at the end of the week where they dealt a little bit with this, uh, uh, the Web three and all that. Um, so yeah, I, I think you know we do need, uh, and I I do need, and we do need as investigative report, uh, reporters to to learn more, you know, and to be a bit more maybe connected to the geopolitics of uh, of the world, um, um, and because we do need to be able to cover global issues um, in a very evidenced uh, um, uh, kind of uh, kind of way that that informs people and that that can um, can um, actually inform uh, decision making in in many of these countries across the divide and and all uh, and i think that's where uh, you know we're kind of lacking and one of the issues right now is the huge amount of data sets that come our way where we do need the the help and the assistance of many of you to be able to to work and understand this data because there's there's a diluvium of uh, of information that comes to the uh, to the way of journalism and really we don't have the capacity so thank you very much i have to say i i, um, I had prepared a few reserve questions uh, just in case there were no questions from the AD, uh, from the audience you know that's a sort of plan for crisis management but i'm i'm happy i didn't have to use them at all as we had such an incredibly active and engaged um, audience for the seminar, and I'm, I'm really grateful. And I think we are just, we're already beyond um, our time that has been assigned to us. This then brings our event um, to the end. I, I'm sure you'll, um, you'll agree with me that many interesting perspectives have been emerged. We were really at an intersection between criminal law and policy, geopolitics, international sanctions. So we have so much to cover. There are many angles, many implications. Such a seminar could have been held in, um, um, could, could have lasted much longer. In any case, it, it's a start and we very much hope that it contributed to the, to the understanding of, of a complex subject and will uh, um, stimulate fresh research and, and analysis, including multidisciplinary uh, research and analysis, which is also very important. So a big thank you to, to our three speakers. It was really, really a privilege to be able to interact with you. 
and benefit from your um, experience and insights. And again, many thanks to all those who took the time to attend this event and enrich it with their questions and, and, and comments. It is highly, highly appreciated. That really brings us to, to the end and I wish you an excellent uh, afternoon, evening or night, depending or morning, perhaps depending on, on where you're connecting from. And I hope there will be many more um, opportunities to, to discuss these issues in the future. So thank you very, very much to everybody.